Good evening. It's Glenda Carr, co-founder and president of Higher Heights for America. How is everybody this October 15th? It's officially, uh, it's been officially fall for a minute. Um, So our summer reading series has officially um, arced into the fall. Uh, Again, I'm Glenda Carr, uh, and this is Higher Heights for America, hashtag Black Women Lead Political Leadership Training Webinar Series. And as for those who have been following us, uh, this is, um, we're doing an author talkback series. We actually organized seven of the black women authors from our summer reading list, the Chisholm list, uh, to do a author talkback. And we are on our second to last author. And, um, you know, a little bit about the Chisholm list. Uh, Shirley Chisholm this year would have been the 50th anniversary of her being sworn in as the first black woman to ever serve in uh, Congress. And so to honor her life and legacy, we are putting out Chisholm lists. This year, it's the um, Chisholm 50. So every list has 50 entries. And we did a summer reading list of an amazing um, list of black authors, many um, writing on uh, leadership, um, political leadership, broader leadership, uh, and we're so excited that we were able to bring this author talk back series. So as I've been saying, you don't have to have read the book. You don't have to be guilty that you actually bought the book and haven't opened it, haven't bought the book yet, that this hour um, allows you to hear from from the author, um, hear a little bit about uh, the origin story of this particular book. Um, and I think what's great about tonight opportunity is it'll be an opportunity um, for many of us who are thinking about writing a book, started writing a book, um, don't know if you could write a book, but really talking about the importance of black women telling their stories. Uh, And so, you know, Higher Heights is the political home for black women's leadership, uh, and we welcome you tonight to our home. So I hope you guys are settled in at home or you're calling in on your commute home, you're sitting in a cafe. I have my cup won't say it's a cup of something. It's a cup of something. (laughs) It's the (laughs) evening, so it could be a cup of tea, a cup of coffee or something. Yes. And so pull up your cup of whatever you're having this evening uh, and join us for a great conversation. We encourage everybody um, to bring others into the community. So we are encouraging uh, social sharing tonight. Um, and so you can share with the hashtag, hashtag Black Women Lead, um, Higher Heights. Um, Twitter handle is at Higher Heights. If you're an Instagram or Facebook person, it is at Higher Heights in the number four. And we want you to bring others into this conversation. Um, this is just one of the programs that Higher Heights uh, has launched over the last year, bringing uh, the opportunity to train black women from the entry point of democracy, um, for being an active voter, to thinking about running for office, running for office, or how we can actually harness our power uh, to move this country to higher heights. Um, You know, at the base of who we are, we are unleashing the political power of black women from the voting booth to elected office. And so if you're new to this community, this is the space to be, to be informed, engaged, and to take action and to be in community. So some housekeeping. If you are using the Anytime um, webinar where you're actually watching the webinar, you can be engaged. There's a uh, uh, an attendee chat um, box uh, click on your left hand, and so you can leave a question um, that uh, when we get to question and answer with our author tonight, uh, you can uh, leave a question there. You could also leave a comment. You can do a thumbs up. Uh, we normally do a um, Uh, roll call. And so we'd love to know where you guys are calling in and dial in. Uh, Many of you are calling and listening to this webinar uh, and conversation on your phone. So you can also be interactive and you can text your questions or tell us where you're dialing in from or if you just want to do a, um, you know, a uh, great job, you know, commentary, you can tweet, you can text us at 646-206. 5931-646-206-5931. So I am so excited to spend the first half of my night, my Tuesday night, with my soror and colleague, uh, yeah, Jamia Wilson. And I do have your uh, Twitter handle wrong, so we will talk about that. I knew in my head it was like, I think your Twitter handle's wrong. Uh, so Jamia is a feminist 
activist, writer, and speaker. She's currently the director at the Feminist Press at the City University of New York and the former VP of Programs at the Women's Media Center, which we will talk about, which is how I met her. Jamia has been a leading voice on women's rights issues for over a decade and has been uh, and her work has appeared in numerous, numerous outlets, including the New York Times, the Today Show, CNN, L, BBC, Rookie, Refinery29, Glamour, Teen Vogue, and the Washington Post. And so this is not her a book that we're going to talk a little bit about uh, is not her first. Uh, she is the author of tonight's book. Young, Gifted, and Black, The Introduction and Oral History uh, in Together We Rise. Oh, and or I read that wrong. The introduction, she's written the introduction and oral history in Together We Rise behind the scenes of the protests heard around the world. Um, Step Into Your Power, 23 Lessons on How to Live Your Best Life. I am definitely trying to le- learn how to live my best mm-hmm. life. Uh, and other numerous um, books and writings. So thank you, Jamia, for spending your fall evening with us here at Higher Heights. Well, thank you so much for having me. There's nothing I'd rather be doing right now, so I'm thrilled to be with you. Great. Let me go on and close out this so y'all can see us. Ah! (laughs) (laughs) So... um, We usually start the evening um, with kind of the origin story of this particular work. Why did you decide to um, focus on young people, Um, you know, not only focus on just highlighting women's leadership, but like young, black, and gifted, Um, and it is a illustration, uh, a book that's illustrated. So share a little bit about, you know, the vision behind this particular book, why did you want to, you know, engage young people and what did you want people to take away um, when walking, um, um, walking away from um, seeing this book? So I wish I could take credit for the impetus for this book, but it actually came to being because I had an amazing set of editors in England for Quarto Publishers who approached me saying, we have this concept for an amazing book that needs to be written that would feature black luminaries from around the world for young people. And we are working with a really amazing black illustrator. And you may have heard of her, Andrea Pippins. And we think you two would be a really great pair to write such a book together. And I said, oh, Andrea Pippins. I went to high school in Maryland. She and I both had been in the DC, Maryland area during the early blogger days. We'd followed each other online. I had been on her Fly Girl blog back in the day and something about the idea and also working with another black woman in publishing on this book really spoke to me, specifically because Children's is also a very much white, uh, mostly white industry. I think 80% of people who do children's books around the world are white across all levels, editorially, production, et cetera. So I just knew this was something I really wanted to do. And because we had so much editorial license over the book that they uh, really gave us the agency to decide who are the people we're featuring? How are we going to position this book? How are we going to curate it? We did it together. And it's a really special book to me too, because at the time, Andrea was pregnant with her son. And we were able to create this book for him and the next generation, the book that we felt we always needed as young black women, the book that we felt that we didn't have. And that's why the book just gives me so much joy because we're now able to see it uh, with many different views from different children from around the world and see how it's special to them and that we know there's a new generation of kids who are going to grow up knowing who... Mary Seacole is, who Usain Bolt is, knowing who Alexandre Dumas was and the fact that he was actually black, which a lot of people didn't know. And that's uh, really what started it. And then I had started working on a, a book for adults with another team of writers at that time too. So it also spoke to different parts of my brain and heart and kind of kept those creative fires going. Great. And, um, 
so one, we're coming um, upon the holiday season or the end of the year. Um, mm-hmm. So I would encourage if you haven't gotten the book that it is a great book to gift um, however you think you should gift. May it be around a holiday or just making sure that our young people have have books um, and being able to touch it and, and, and to feel it. It is a beautifully illustrated and very brightly um, uh, brightly colored design um, that I think will attract young people to the book and being able to share. I think you, you did some of the usual suspects, but you also, you know, introduced people to um, the little known or the hidden figures in our history. So who do you think is the, your, I'm going to do two questions, your favorite person that you wrote about in the book? And then second, if it is a, di- oh, she, we lost her. I'm here. I'm here. I think it's oh, just, I think it's just my camera one second. <laughs> okay, great. Um, and then who is your second? Um, and then so who's your favorite story in the book? And if it's a, I'm assuming it probably might be a second person. Who is your favorite illustration in the book and why? Mm. So my favorite story in the book, it's so hard. I, I don't have children, but I often think that maybe it's kind of like picking your favorite child. I, mm. I think depending on the week that I'm in, I have a, a different favorite. Well, who and are you channeling today? Who are you channeling today? Today, who am I channeling? Mm, I'm channeling Toni Morrison today because mm. we're talking about authors and we're talking about black women's power and leadership. And I f- look up to her as an author, but also as an editor. She had a really rich history um, around not only being a stellar writer, but also an editor who also was responsible for helping to midwife so many other people's books out into the world, including Muhammad Ali's biography, for example, his autobiography. So I think, or the black book, which I felt like, you know, Mm -hmm. every black child I had grew up with that book in our home. (laughs) And so Mm -hmm. uh, she's one that I, that I really think about a lot. And I feel really honored to have been able to study her life, to be able to write about her and to learn about her childhood. Because a big part of how we envisioned the book was that we wanted to talk about the great things that these amazing luminaries achieved, but also to talk about what made them great, strengths they noticed as children, strengths they developed as children, the things that gave them joy that inspired them. So to learn about Toni Morrison, who was also Chloe Wofford as a child, and to learn Mm. about her life and to learn about the fact that others looked up to her in school because she was always a purposeful, strong student. And to know about her background was a really great blessing in the process of writing and inspired me as a writer to say, I'm blessed to be able to write about Toni Morrison. And she paved the way for me to be able to have this book. And then illustration wise, I have two favorites. One is Usain Bolt and the other's Muhammad Ali and Mm. no three. And the third is Misty Copeland. And the reason that they're my favorites is because Andrea has so expertly captured the movement in their bodies and kids will send me pictures and drawings or tag Andrea and I on Instagram of pictures of them doing the images. So we get a lot of kids doing this with the Muhammad Ali. We get a lot of kids doing this with Usain Bolt. (laughs) Uh, Mm -hmm. We get a lot of people jumping and doing beautiful ballet moves in the spirit of Misty. And so I love that the book also inspires them to be active off the page. Yeah. Well, that has to be like just a great uh, uh, new ability for you to engage, you know, uh, young readers. Um, I'm assuming... I'm going to talk a little bit about your origin story was, were you an avid reader when you were little? Absolutely. Um, I am in my apartment right now. And if you were to look to my left and to my right and to the back Mm -hmm. of me, there are shelves of books that go up the wall. Um, And that was very much like the house I grew up in. So I grew up with very strong bibliophile family. My parents were professors and I received a lot of books and a lot of gifts and books from many of the people in my life. And I spent a lot of time in the library. Uh, And so even now, my office is also full of books. And one of the problems I think I have the most in life is that I don't have enough space for all the books that I have and want around me at any given time. 
Hmm. And what was your favorite book growing up mm. as a child, I should say? Yeah. Well, what was your favorite book as a child? What was your favorite book as a teen? Mm. As a child, I loved A Snowy Day. That was a beautiful book. Um, and I always felt connected with the imagery of that book and, and the beauty of that book. Um, there was another book called Stone Soup that I also loved a lot as a, as a small child. And then as a teenager, Anything by Judy Bloom was my absolute favorite. Um, and I'm so obsessed to the point where I'm actually looking up. I have a shelf right here that has a first edition copy of the book um, from about 50 years ago that I bought at a rare bookshop in London because I'm that much of a nerd um, because it was called Iggy's House. And it was about mm -hmm. a black family moving to an all white neighborhood. And I felt that um, that was a really important book for me, even though I was born maybe 10 years after this book came out because I'd experienced with my family moving into mostly white communities and kind of seeing myself in a book for one of the first times through that book. So it meant so much to me that I went to get one of the originals just last year. Oh, that is great. My favorite book, I was looking around because I'm actually in uh, at home. As y'all know, when y'all see the red background, I'm home <laughs> or at one of my homes because I split my time. Um, and But it is the home that has the uh, my, my books. And so my collection is a little smaller because I actually worked with my cousin on the whole notion of gifting books. Mm -hmm. um, so I only held on to the things that I absolutely loved or, or they were signed or they were the first edition. But I have, it's a dispute among my brothers. I'm the baby. And so, of course, I inherited all their books. So they still feel like they're their book. It's mm -hmm. their books. So we have like Oliver, um, which was their favorite books. I could probably give them the Oliver book. Um, but my favorite book was The Red Balloon. I love um, that book. <laughs> so I have a Red Balloon hard copy. Uh, and I definitely was a Judy Bloom um, fan. Um, and so... So I actually probably don't know this. Like, what was your original trajectory? Did you know you were always going to be a writer? Did mm. you stumble across being a writer? Because um, all I know is you're like, you're, the, you're this great writer. Yes, I always knew that I wanted to be a writer, but I didn't envisage a time in my life where it would be the way that I would make my living. I always thought that writing was something I had to do and I took it seriously as something that was a part of me, but I didn't know that I could actually have it be such a part of my life and every level. And it's something I always wanted and thought wasn't possible. And then over time, continuing to do it, to focus on my writing and any job I had, you know, just saying this is a strength I have and I want to continue to flex it. Uh, it kind of manifested into something that has become a bigger part of my professional life. Uh, so it's always something that has meant a lot to me, but I almost treated it as if it's something that had to happen after school or on the night shift for, for many years. And in some ways it still happens in some ways, my personal writing happens on the night shift. Uh, but I never dreamed that I would have multiple books at this point in my life. And, uh, but I always knew it was part of my character and identity. And in large part, I can thank my parents for that because my parents very much encouraged my writing. They sent me to writing camp as a child. Mm. Writing camp actually exists. <laughs> and they took me seriously as a writer. And so I always tell adults who are raising young children or who are around kids now to really take those interests and inclinations seriously, because I think I'm proof of what that can do in a person's life, that they always believe that I could do this. And that helped me kind of gain the confidence to believe it too. That's great. I forgot we didn't do the corrector. Um, so if you're looking to um, post the social and tag Jamia, it's Jamia, J-A-M-I-A-W. Or please tag me at, at Glenda Carr, G-L-Y-N-D-A-C-A-R-R. -R, and, of course, at Higher Heights um, and hashtag Black Women Lead. Um, so, Jamia, I met you initially, and we're going to talk spend the next couple, next 15 minutes just talking about um, uh, the, how Black women can kind of step off the sidelines. Um, we have lots to say. <laughs> um, and... Um, 
uh, it is not that there's a uh, uh, there's always an opportunity for more of us to say say it in different mediums. Mm-hmm. So um, I met you when you were at the Women's Media Center, uh, and so as it relates to Black women being in the media, both written and broadcast. Um, oftentimes our voices are still not heard, um, and um, you were running a training program. Um, and I really call it a boot camp because we walked in and we're like, wait, what's going on? We're an ambush interview. But the importance <laughs> of women, you know, telling their stories, um, and particularly uh, in this environment, telling our stories so that it connects to policies, telling our stories to be able to move movements, Um Share a little bit about your uh, wh- why you believe it's important for Black women to be storytellers, and that there's there's roles to play. From um, you did this, she did this great webinar. So if you go to our website at Higher Heights for America uh, and find her her webinar, I think now maybe two years ago that this talked about. It could be a letter to the editor, but just how how do we begin um, to know that our story matters uh, and uh, the different ways that we can communicate that, in particular for this webinar in the written form. Mm. So, you know, I what I love about talking to Black women about this is that we are naturally already doing the storytelling work in our communities because it's such a rich part of the African-American narrative tradition that mm-hmm. storytelling is a part of how we engage each other, how we communicate, how we support each other. And I think that I feel really lucky to be a part of a lineage that has that because I tap into that often as a writer uh, and tap into it kind of saying, oh, this is who we are. This is our culture. This is, you know, how we engage and connect. And we're telling stories at the beauty parlor. We're telling stories in our spiritual communities. We're telling stories to each other when we're having brunch with our friends. And one of the things that I think is important is that so many of the stories that we are telling each other aren't being amplified because of all of the systemic barriers to Black women's voices being uplifted. So it's not that we have a lack of ideas or a lack of expertise. It's that the real systemic and structural injustices that we face, which I don't have to tell you all about, (laughs) um, Mm -hmm. those block us from being able to access the same sort of amplification of our ideas and our dreams and our storytelling. And that needs to change. We have only 5% of the media licenses in the world are held by women. So you can imagine if only 5% of those are held by women, how much of a fraction upon a fraction upon a fraction of that Black women own or have access to. And Mm. when you know about those kinds of statistics, it's very powerful because we can actually say, hey, this thing that is often said to us, which is, oh, the reason you don't see diversity is we just couldn't find a black woman expert on that subject, or we didn't have the binders full of black women (laughs) to to engage about this. We know it's actually structural, and we know it's an issue of access and connection and it's about power and ownership and and that there's a whole media justice movement that is working with many black women um, now also in leadership with others who are trying to change this to say that we recognize that open participation in the media is a form of power. It has the ability to influence our culture. It influences how we think of ourselves and other people. And it also influences what we think about policies and how others regard us and it influences politics uh, here being at higher heights. I think that's extremely important. And so that's why we need to lift up those stories of, you know, the political conversations I know y'all are all having at the salon because I'm having them (laughs) or in a cab (laughs) or when you are telling people who might misunderstand the context about how an issue is affecting our community and you want to broadcast it, that, there's a structural reason why that's not getting the same sort of lift that other stories are getting. So it's really important to me for us to dismantle those barriers to access, but to also create our own media so that we can shape a story of truth that fully represents who we are, not someone else's version of the truth about us. And if it's not done by us, it's not going to be for us. And that's one of the reasons I create books. Mm. 
And what is your advice for someone who may be tuning in who, like I said, are think, is thinking about writing a book um, or is writing a book um, about how do you structure um, – where, as you know, black women do a thousand things. So we are working. We are, you know, in some um, aspects taking care of our home, you know, our partner, our children, um, a family member. Uh, we're active in our community, you know, um, uh, organization or faith, you know, um, our, our our church. How do you, I would love to hear your process because you are that mm-hmm. person too, right? <laughs> How do you organize your day to just even begin? I, I, let's take the book out because that's the whole, like, write a book. But how do you structure the day to ensure that you're writing? Is it, you know, and again, you might channel your your before your book self. Like, is it like mm-hmm. being disciplined around journaling? How do you schedule your day? How do you not punish yourself because you haven't written in a month? Talking to myself. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, so... I want to first admit, because I think it's important to tell the truth about these things, that I run the gamut in terms of how my like psychological state at any given moment affects my writing rituals and habits. <laughs> and I think that that's important to admit because, you know, I could hear, sit here and say, oh, I wake up at 545 5, every day. <laughs> And and do my writing. And I write for two hours and da, 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 da. <laughs> exactly. And some people do do that. And what I can say is there are times when I am very driven, and where I have a deadline or I have something, and I'll say I'm going to wake up early and for and I'll say for the next three weeks I'm up early from five thirty to seven thirty writing before I go to work, before I get breakfast, before I do the things. But then there are other times when. I am thinking the only time I have to write is on the subway and I am going to be writing freehand things that I'm going to type in later, putting things into Evernote and creating the ideas or outlines for things that I need to write. I am constantly engaging with things I want to write about often through Evernote and through Notes app and things like that. I think it's become what napkins used to be for me, kind of writing down things like that. I I always have in my purse a little notebook, like a a little moleskin notebook about this size that I carry around wherever I'm going just so I don't lose an idea, which is my perpetual fear. But I have learned to be a little bit more gentle with myself about doing the kind of writing ritual I need given the flow of my life. I used Mm. to think, oh, okay, I have to be doing X number of words a day. I had been on a 500 word a day thing for a while that, you know, oh, I have to write 500 to 1,000 words to feel like I was successful. And then I realized that that was tapping into anxiety, which is something that I live with. So I thought, oh, well, this isn't actually nourishing for me. It feeds into something that I struggle with. Instead, what would it be if I just made a commitment to myself to write something every day that was for Mm -hmm. me? And so most often that could be anything from, yes, free form writing an idea that I just had to get out of me that could later become an op-ed or later become a book idea, and that's happened. Or it could be something as simple as one practice I have now is ever since my mom's passed away, I have written her letters. Because Mm. we had a practice of writing each other very often. And so I'll often read emails we had and kind of say, oh, this is more now what I wanted to, how I wanted to thank you for that wisdom or how I would have continued the conversation now. And I have actually have a special box that's shaped like a book that uh, Mm. I bought on a trip in Paris that I open up and I put her letters in. Um, And it's been a really beautiful practice because I find that when I write those letters, I feel like writing that there's something that happens mm. to my soul. So I think everyone has a ritual. And because I think my creative energy comes from a spiritual place, that kind of engagement is what really works for me. But then the last thing I'll say is what I also have decided to do, which I think was good advice a writing coach once gave me that I would be remiss if I didn't share, is that I was told to just create sanctuary to find a space that felt to me like sanctuary where I could always write. And I took that really Mm -hmm. seriously. I bought 
a little desk. I live in New York, so this is a little desk, the one I'm using right mm-hmm. now. But I bought the most beautiful little desk I could find that I would want to sit at. I bought a chair in my favorite color with the right kind of cushioning and the right pillow with a little ottoman for my feet at the bottom. And it has art all around it with a list of my goals and some of my favorite books. And the reason Mm -hmm. that I was given this advice was that if you have a writing sanctuary that is so purposeful and so sacred to you, you won't have as many excuses to leave it. Mm. And it's really worked for me. (laughs) So I want to share that with (laughs) others. I mean, it even has um, the lighting for this. I have special lights that I brought right here because I found myself procrastinating saying, the lighting's not good. Oh, the pillow's not fluffy enough for my butt. You know, whatever (laughs) things that we do in our minds (laughs) to get up from writing. And so I decided you're going to get some pillows that are so fluffy <laughs> that you, you don't can't complain. Get up. You can't complain. So create that writing sanctuary and it can be so simple and it, it doesn't have to cost a lot, but it just has to feel special to you. Thanks for sharing those two uh, amazing um, uh, routines uh, that work for you. I definitely uh, have taken mental note. We have a question. Uh, and so um, how do uh, how to go about writing a blog as a start, and uh, that could develop into the book into a book, mm-hmm. um, which obviously you were a huge um, as you talked about the early years of blogs, <laughs> <laughs> um, but kind of how do you progress from you know starting with a you know um, a blog? I think what is so great about now is that you know there's some precedent for how some blogs have become really successful books. And I love that the format itself, you know, that there's there's kind of a imagery that people have around it. It's, uh, it captures the moment and timeliness of a different event or a cultural movement in a way that um, maybe a traditional novel form might not work. So you'll mm-hmm. act- actually see some fiction that's written in the blog form, right? And the reason I share that is to say that I think it's a format, you know, just like any other, and that the content that you have in it can be just as rich from that format. So if you started a blog, don't think, oh, because it was a blog, it can't become a book. Like a book is a somehow higher end object or something like that. Because our society does kind of lift it up that way. But really, There are blogs that I have been riveted by for years and years and years that keep me coming back for more that have turned into books. Uh, One of my favorites is the Crunk Feminist Collection. Mm -hmm. And that is a book that the Feminist Press published. I'm really proud to be a publisher of that book. And that was a blog that was written by a bunch of women of color, including Black women scholars who were in academia blogging about hip hop culture and feminism on the night shift. And that blog turned into a book and a movement. And that team has now gone on to write another book that they're um, putting out for young women soon and and young people, young feminists. And they're doing amazing work. And many of those writers have gone on to write their own books on their own about other subjects and their expertise. So if you have a blog and you want to turn that into a book, actually think of it as an asset because what the blog actually gives you is similar to what every publisher will want when you start talking about your book, which is your table of contents, the skeleton, mm. what what is the structure, right? So your blog kind of forces that by virtue of its format. And I would tap into that to think about, okay, how do I translate that into a book proposal format? How do I use the structure that the blog gave me to break this down into chapters and themes and topics? Great. So that actually leads me to uh, my next question. But just to remind people, if you want to leave, uh, ask a question, you can go to the chat room uh, the attendee chat room and leave a message there, or you can text, of course, I don't never know the number by heart, 646-206-5931, 646-206-5931. So talk a little bit about your role. You, I think you've been there, what, three years now? It'll be almost three years um, in 2020. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. At leading feminist press, uh, which is a big deal because not only because it's like my friend um, <laughs> leading feminist press, it is a young uh, woman of color, a black woman. So tell a little bit about um, your new role at feminist press, the, the, the fact that it is history making because you are sitting at, sitting at decision making tables, really being able to make decisions and investment uh, in getting out um, uh, books uh, like um, the Crunk Feminist uh, Collective uh, in a way that is, uh, is, is exciting. Thank you so much. And thank you for your support. It means the world. I joined Feminist Press in its 47th year of history as the youngest person to ever become the director of the press and publisher of the press, but also the first black woman, first woman of color. And that was a major moment for the press, but a major moment for me too, because I grew up reading feminist press books. My mom had them on her shelf and several of the books that taught me about black feminism were books by the feminist press including Zora Neale Hurston's reader that Alice Walker unearthed about 50 years ago uh, and published with Feminist Press, which we'll be reissuing in 2020. I love myself when I'm laughing. And then Mm -hmm. the But Some of Us Are Brave anthology, which I'm sure many of you have also heard of. And those books raised me and they helped me think about the world in a different way and to think about my my life and my power in a different way. So now that I have the opportunity to give back to an organization who produced books that grew my mind, helped me connect with my mother, uh, is profound. And to also be able to be one of a very few Black women in publishing at the director position, making sure, as Roxane Gay says, that we may be the first, but we're not the last. And that is something that I'm really committed to in terms of thinking about who we hire, the interns that work with us, who joins our team, what kinds of designers are we working with to design our covers, and how are we expanding even more our commitment to intersectional publishing, which was already there before I joined the feminist press, but deepening our commitment to uplifting marginalized and insurgent voices. And that's why our new mission statement is that we are working to create a more just world where everyone can recognize themselves in a book. Because Mm. when we have that in the world, that would have meant we had a cultural shift where all of our power and freedom and liberation was recognized. So I I love the work that I get to do every day. And what I mainly love is also being able to uplift people's voices who the world needs to hear and to help publicize the amazing work they're doing and to help them see that they don't just have even one book within them, but they probably have many that the world really needs. And someone had done that for me, a mentor who said when I said, oh, I just have to do this one book. And she said, oh, you're writing your proposal as if you don't have the rest of your life to write the eight or nine books that I see in your future or more. Mm. And that really changed my life and that's what I want to be for others and Black women specifically. Well, you touched upon what was going to be my last question because I was going to go to a question from the attendees, but since you started it, in uh, a quick um, uh, a quick review on what makes a great book proposal? Mm. What makes a great book proposal? So what makes a great book proposal is have a clear vision for your book. So have a clear overview for what you want to have in your book, what what you need to do. Express differentiation. What does your book have to offer that hasn't been said yet? Mm-hmm. How does it differ from other books that are out in the market? And even name what those books might be. And it doesn't have to be in a competitive standpoint, but just to say, oh, this is how I would enter into the conversation that these exists are talking about or has been left out of the conversation. One public like especially today is a marketing plan. How mm-hmm. is your specific work, your community, the niche you're tapping into, going to help get people engaged in 
buy a book and get them to buy this book. Uh, having a strong table of contents, having a schedule for what the book structure would look like and what it would entail. Having three simple chapters, and people hate this part, I found. The three, I've had so many people just say, can I get out of the three sample chapters? People mm-hmm. don't want to do those three sample chapters. And having been one of them, I can say that doing three sample chapters actually gives you a lot of clarity about where you're where you get the deal. Anyway. So do the three chapters because once you have the deal, I don't have those three chapters to write. <laughs> or I only have to edit those chapters. Uh, it helps you get a head start, and it's actually kind of an investment in your faith in yourself that you're going to mm-hmm. do the book. So all of those things are really important to have, and also to make sure that if you're pitching to a publisher that takes open submissions, that you read really carefully what their specific requirements are, what their editorial vision statement is. Sometimes people get rejected, and they take it to heart, and they don't realize that if they'd read the editorial vision statement for that publisher, they weren't a fit anyway. Maybe they write science fiction and that publisher only does historical biographies or something like that. Mm -hmm. So I think it's important to kind of do your homework too. But um, if you have those components in a proposal, you'll be starting off really strong. And and then also making sure you have a bio about yourself. Tell the publisher about yourself. Explain who you are and why you are the person who is most well positioned to write on this particular subject or this particular book. Right. Thanks. Uh, And so the last question, let me just make sure there's no more questions on the phone, is... um, is you uh, can you talk about what outlets are available to Black women's voices, and it and and is it necessary to access mainstream media? It's a really good question. What I think is important to remember is that we have to decide what points of entry are the best for our message. So I think that knowing our audience is the most important thing. When I'm trying to determine where I'm going to pitch a story, I'm often thinking, who do I want to get this message in front of? Who needs Mm -hmm. to hear this? Who needs to know about this? Who can actually enact change if they hear about this? How many people will see it? That kind of thing. And it helps to impact where I'm deciding to pitch or where I'm recommending for an author to pitch a story as well. And Mm -hmm. one of the reasons I've been able to do several book projects is because I had established myself online through a lot of different online and print uh, magazines and other sorts of uh, outlets. And I diversified those outlets because I just loved writing and I was intentional about, you know, writing for places that aligned in most cases with my sort of ideological viewpoints or angle, but I also would like to kind of do at least a couple times a year, a pitch that scared me pitching to Mm -hmm. an outlet that felt above my uh, weight class. If I were to be a boxer, the way I would see it sometimes, or uh, other times I would see it as something that scared me because I wasn't used to writing in that format or in that uh, particular voice or structure. And for me, those have been some of the best experiences for me to kind of identify places where I can also write about the issues I care about, but for a new audience. So for example, one of my favorite pieces I've ever gotten to write was about Black women's political participation in Glamour magazine. And Mm. That was a magazine I read a lot growing up. I loved it. And I always thought, oh, if I wrote for Glamour, I would have wanted to write a feature about pop culture or something like that. But it was an amazing experience to be able to write a piece that felt so personally meaningful as a Black woman to document this historic moment of a record number of Black women running for office across party in Alabama. And 
it also allowed me to be a part of the changing story of Glamour as a magazine. And that is something that really very much excited me. So what I want to say to Sheila, who to ask this question is, all of the outlets should be our outlets. <laughs> Some of them just don't know it yet. And to really think about what message you have. And also to think about what can get your message out in the most effective way. So a lot of times people will say, oh, we need to get this to Oprah or we need to get this on the cover of the New York Times, right? You hear that all the time. Every nonprofit I've been at, we always joke about how someone inevitably is going to say that. And sometimes if you have a very specific story, the most important place to get your story pitched might be the local paper that your local politicians read. And it might be Politico or The Hill, or it might be another a Scientific American if you're in a science community that wants to be more mainstream. And so I do want to invite people to think too more broadly than the usual five that we think about and to think about mm -hmm. who is it we want to receive our message and then have that dictate the outlets. And also to know the sky's the limit that even if you're early in writing in your career, don't feel intimidated about pitching to places that scare you because you might be surprised that next thing you know, you'll get an assignment and that'll be your first piece. Wow. Well, Jamia, thank you for taking the first part of your evening to spend with us uh, and not only share your latest um, uh, book, uh, Young, Black, and Talented. Is that, did I get that right? Young, Young Black, and Black, but I like Young, Black, and Talented. Young, 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 uh, young Black, and Gifted. Yeah. Said that right, right? Um, and so um, thank you for spending the time talking about your new book. Um, but also sharing a little bit about your journey as a writer and more importantly, sharing some amazing, like actionable um, ways for us to start thinking about or leaning in uh, to us um, putting our thoughts and our experiences down on paper. So thank you so much for being a great friend of Higher Heights and always mm -hmm. lending your voice. I think she will probably always be um, um, part of our yearly series because I think it's important. So we might have to dust off that original training uh, about harnessing your your um, voice in this um, um, in this season. So I look forward to you know potentially you know developing out a series with um, Feminist Press. Uh, to ensure that we are investing in the next um, next person to write an article, the next letter um, letter to the editor, the next author. So thank you so much. So this is um, the uh, second to last. Uh, we initially, when we curated this, what, Jumia was going to be our last um, webinar because we thought it was important to end with inspiring people to uh, consider writing um, writing a book. Um, but we had a scheduling change, and so our last book, which still is an amazing last book, is uh, one of our uh, colleagues, Tiffany Dufu, who wrote a book called Drop the Ball. So if you are figuring out how to like jug juggle your life, um, family life, work life, passion life, um, and being okay with dropping that ball, um, Kimberly, the other co-founder and I always talk about is the ball not only dropped, is it up under the bed or under the couch? <laughs> and so not only do you have to bend down to go get it, you got to go reach for it. I absolutely think uh, this session is um, for you. And more importantly, this session uh, is being moderated by Kimberly Peeler Allen, um, and who is juggling a lot uh, as a national leader, a mom, a wife, and, and actually someone who is writing a, 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 currently writing a book. So join us. Um, we got a little bit of a break, November 5th, which is election day. So we're telling everybody, go, if you didn't early vote, vote early in the day so that you can settle in. We are starting a little later that night because we want to make sure people are going out to vote uh, in your local elections um, at 8 p.m. So meet us on November 5th at 8 p.m. for our last of this series. But we uh, have been talking about, there were 15, 50 uh, authors on this summer reading list that maybe we'll do one a month. Um, this was wildly uh, a popular series, and uh, I've heard from many saying that this was um, a great opportunity. Uh, someone just said in the chat room, this has been very informative, uh, inspired, and hope 
uh, more black, uh, more women start to write. Um, and so we know that this is a space that Higher Heights is creating for us to be informed, engaged, and to take action. So um, a little bit more about Higher Heights. How can you be involved? Support our programs. Um, our webinar series is one in a series of our signature programs, but participate in our Sunday brunches. So people are like, oh, where are the Sunday brunches? Sometimes they're in person, but they are virtual brunches. And we did that in a way to ensure that our voices were heard on Sunday. As you know, oftentimes Sunday is when we catch up on our news. Sunday is the political talk um, Sundays with all of your network um, political shows, and oftentimes we don't see ourselves. So we want to make sure that we are recapping um, the month, the days, and the week's news um, from a black woman's perspective. And so look out for our new uh, 2020 redesigned and rebooted Sunday brunch series. Uh, and we will also be bringing back our Sister to Sister Salon conversations in 2020. And so by logging on and RSVPing for this, you have become a member of Higher Heights Growing Community of Black Women and Allies across this country. And we look forward to you unlocking uh, your leadership potential and moving up our steps of engagement from being an active uh, general member to investing in our work so that we can provide these free, let's say, I feel like church, say it, free webinar series so that black women across this country, we're able to touch black women across this country um, who have access either online or on their phones. Eighty Over 86% of black women have access to smartphones. So we thought this was a great way to be able to reach many black women um, across this country. So we look for you to continue to be engaged. And we want to, boom, ah, my favorite photo for a variety of reasons. I look young. I look thin. And I'm sitting next to my girl, Ayanna Presley. Uh, when we took this photo, it was her idea to gather 100 black women in black women lead t-shirts at the mock Senate chamber in um, Boston, uh, the Edward Kennedy um, uh, Institute that has a mock chamber. And she literally gathered um, more than 100 women because once people heard that we were doing this, we had 100 women seated and we had almost 100 women in the gallery. Um, and so it shows you the power in our numbers. Uh, and we're so excited about the long-term relationship that we had with Ayana. I'm sure she will say the same thing in Kimberly Hughes on the uh, other side by Ayana. We all look great in this photo. Uh, and so I love uh, leaving everyone with this photo if you're watching it because it makes me happy because we know that black women lead and we're going to continue to move this country to higher heights. So thank you for taking look at this. I'm, we're even giving you four minutes back so that you can write something. Um, uh, thank you for joining us this evening. Thank you, Jamia Wilson, for okay. your leadership. Thank you for inspiring more um, black women to share their stories in writing. And thank you, everyone, for spending this evening with us.